Uh, sir, now you can uh, turn on your video as well as uh, microphone. Hello, how are you? Uh, fine, uh, thanks, uh, sir. My name is Bipin. I'm uh, a faculty at the uh, Ambedkar School of Economics. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, and uh, Professor Bhanu is uh, already here. Hi, Sanjeev. Hi, how are you? Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> For no yeah, yeah. So, so what do you want me to do as chairman other than hang around? No, no, I think. <laughs> I mean, I immediately after uh, Professor Pangaria, you can give your, I mean, uh, view or you will take on the issue that he dealt with. And uh, your other work, uh, we will take care. Deepin will take care of other uh, Q and A things. If yeah. it is offline, yeah. okay. So I'm yeah. sticking around. Okay. okay. You have yeah. to do. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So hopefully, I'll get to visit you someday. I'm yeah, yeah. That I'm is, never is, be with uh, me. I hope that you will visit so soon. Uh, that is more important. <laughs> no, no. So whenever this thing comes off, let's organize a plan and let me come. Yeah, uh, yeah. It doesn't have to be a board meeting or anything. Otherwise, we'll never manage to coordinate a schedule. Correct, so I'll correct. just organize uh, as soon as things become safe. I'll come. Sure, sure, Sanjeev. We will. We will definitely be on that. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just so we'll uh, switch the camera off for the time. Yeah, yeah. We'll Come back in 10 to 12 yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank okay. You. okay. <coughs> Lepin, yeah, Lepin. Yeah, I've shared the YouTube link and it is going live now and it is working fine. I've muted myself. Okay, okay. So things are fine as of now. Um, you can just take the show. I will be there backside. Any help, you can just drop me a message. Or you can just um, call my name. I'll be keeping my headphone on and I'll be waiting. Hmm? Yeah. Okay.
Bipin, Dr. Pargaya joined. Bipin? Bipin? Sir, sir, I'll take care. Uh, I don't know, Bipin, what happened. I'm, I'm here, sir, I'll do that. Hello. Hello, sir. Hi, sir. Hello. Good morning, sir. Uh, uh, ah, good morning. Uh, so so I just morning. wanted to. I just wanted to be sure that you know my cameras are correct, which I think seems to be right. Camera, we camera, we are at, we are not able to see your. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, now it's fine, sir. Yeah, you should speak also. Yes, now it's fine. Sir. Hello, sir. How are you? I am very well. Thank fine, you. sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for uh, accepting this lecture. So it's, uh, we have been looking forward for this for some time. Uh, <laughs> Sanjeev is already. Ah, there it is. There is Sanjeev. <laughs> Hi, Sanjeev. How are you? I am very well. Thank you. How are you? Well, um, personally, fine. Obviously, we have gone through a major second wave, which had uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's but at a personal level, obviously, many people I know didn't uh, were affected. But of course, we now have to dig this economy out of uh, again. Just uh, after having succeeded, I think in 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 by January March, it looked like we had really managed to get the economy running again. Yeah. And then back two months later, back to where we were. So we'll have to do it again. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. You see, I mean, this is what I have been saying in all my interviews that this virus is incredibly unpredictable. And the economy, I mean, otherwise, the economy is sound and it'll do quite well. But, you know, if the virus keeps hitting us, then, then all bets get off. Um, yeah. So this is yeah. going to be a tough one because, you see, this time around, um, it has really hit uh, middle Very class. Hard. Everybody, everybody. No, I mean, I've lost several friends. Yeah, so in the first round, it was a theoretical problem. Yeah. And the problem was the lockdown. This time, we have physically lost people. So, you know, there is something to be said about the psychological impact of it. Yeah, very true, very true. No doubt. So, anyway, yeah, I mean, do it again. I, Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Sandeep, if you know, uh, first of all, um, are we in the public space now or private space? Uh, oh, sir, we are the YouTube, the, yeah. YouTube, YouTube uh, live that has just started. Okay. Okay, so then we'll not. Okay. Yeah. Then I want to be careful about what we say. Uh, also, uh, I must uh, tell you this in advance. Uh, some uh, people already have, uh, you know, put out, put down their comments when they uh, registered uh, for the event, and uh, there are a lot of questions which are specific to COVID. Uh, maybe we'll raise a few of them during the Q and A session. Yeah. So we can take those up, but uh, in my presentation, I'm not focusing on, on uh, COVID. Okay. Uh, fine, sir. I, I, but I'll take the questions. No problem. Also, sure. all the questions should be directed, directed to me. I, I think, you know, Sanjeev has been very gracious to, to agree to chair this, uh, the session, but okay. burden of answering particularly critical, difficult questions should be on me, not on him. I mean, okay. this is, having said that, of course, if, if Sanjeev wants to take any of those, that, that, are, that is fine as well. Sure, sir. So I'm going to start admitting people now.
Uh, we have a session going on in uh, Microsoft Teams. Simultaneously, this is uh, uh, live streamed in the YouTube uh, base university channel as well. So most of our students are joining from uh, the base university YouTube channel and eventually, you know, depends on the crowd that joins the meeting. So we have some number restrictions there. Okay, so I'm going to admit everybody. Bipin, can we start now? Yes, sir, we can start. Sir, Professor Pangaria, can we start? Hello. Professor Pangaria, sir? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, can we start, sir? Yeah, of course. OK. Uh, so good evening. Um, uh, and welcome to this base event. In fact, good morning, Professor Pangaria, for you it's in the morning. Um, uh, this is an event organized by uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar School of Economics, Bangalore. Um, uh, I'm not sure you know about this university. This is relatively a new university uh, instituted by the government of Karnataka as a tribute to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, uh, who was an economist to begin with, and later, as we all know, a renowned jurist and uh, father of Indian Constitution. Uh, recently, we at BASE, we have initiated a BASE University a Distinguished Lecture Series, wherein we invite a very distinguished economist and public policy makers to give a open lecture on the topic of their choice. Uh, today, we are having the second lecture in this series, and the first lecture was given by uh, uh, Dr. Avinash Dixit, uh, of Princeton University in the month of March. Uh, today's lecture is going to be delivered by uh, Professor Arvind Pangaria, a professor of economics and the Jagdish Bhagwati professor of in political economy at 
Columbia University uh, on the topic, uh, a very interesting topic that is Indian economy challenges and opportunities. Uh, for the audience who are reading and writing on Indian economy and the public policy making, I'm sure um, you know, uh, Professor Pangari doesn't need any introduction. However, um, as I said, uh, there are many of our students who are very young. Uh, we just jo joined this university as um, young students of economics. I would like to introduce uh, very briefly uh, with the permission of Professor Pangaria. Apart from uh, being a professor of uh, economics at Columbia University, uh, Professor Pangaria was the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog um, in the rank of a cabinet minister and he was India's Sherpa to G20 meetings. Uh, he also served as a chief economist at the Asian Development Bank. Um, uh, Professor Pongari has authored more than 15 books. Uh, his recent book was on India Unlimited, Reclaiming the Last Glory. And his earlier books, uh, India, the Emerging Giant, which was published in 2008, was listed as a top pick of 2008 by the a very well-known magazine, The London Economist, and described as the definitive book on the Indian economy. Uh, the Economist described his another book, uh, which is a very, again, very popular one, Why Growth Matters, uh, which was co-authored with uh, Professor Jagdish Bhagavati as a manifesto for policymakers and analysts. But more than these books, for me, uh, which is very touchy in my view, his latest book, my father, The Extraordinary Life on, of an Extraordinary Man, uh, released last week. I think that's a very, very, uh, very, very touchy book for us. And I think we need to learn a lot from Professor Pangaria um, on this aspect. And he has written a lot of scientific papers, uh, which has appeared in uh, top economics journals, such as American Economic Review, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Review of Economic Studies, um, International Economic Review, but also in foreign affairs as well as foreign policy. And we all know that he writes a monthly column, very, very popular monthly column um, in the Times of India. And he also written guest columns in various other reputed uh, uh, dailies like Financial Times, Wall Street Journal and India Today. In March 2012, the government of India honored Professor Pangaria with a very prestigious Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian honor uh, the country bestows in any field. We are indeed honored that Professor Pangaria agreed to give this lecture. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'll also like to introduce uh, another distinguished public policy maker who is going to chair this session, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Sanyal, who is currently the principal economic advisor to Minister of Finance. Before he joined government, he was Deutsche Bank's global strategist and a managing director till 2015. He is also the author of several books, uh, including The Indian Renaissance, India's Rise After a Thousand Years of Decline, Land of the Seven Rivers, A Brief History of India's Geography, The Incredible History of India's Geography, The Ocean of Churn, How Human History Was Shaped by the Indian Ocean, and a Life Over Two Beers. Uh, in fact, he is one of the most sought after speaker in the Lit Fest, especially um, uh, in Jaipur Literature, literature Festivals. Um, Sanjeev Sanwal was named Young Global Leader for 2010 uh, by the World Economic Forum in Davos, an honor given to select individuals below the age of 40 for their outstanding contributions uh, in various fields. He is a Rhodes Scholar and was also awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship in 2007 for his work on urban systems. And um, uh, he has many, many awards and he's also a fellow of the Royal uh, Geographical Society London and of IDFC Institute Bombay. And above all, Sanjeev is a very distinguished member of our governing council. Uh, we welcome Sanjeev for this lecture. Um, we, we also welcome all other distinguished members, uh, faculty and students. Thank you, Professor Bhanumurthy. Uh, thanks very much to Base University for this uh, very warm and kind uh, invitation. Thank you, Professor Bhanumurthy, for that uh, uh, glowing introduction. Uh, and above all, my greatest thanks to uh, Sanjeev, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal for agreeing to chair this session. Uh, I know he's a busy man and, and uh, currently with the crisis on, uh, uh, his, his uh, 
demands on his time are probably 10x of uh, the normal demand, where normal demand itself is not so small. Uh, let me just uh, put in a plug for my latest book. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, don't read, uh, if you don't want to read, don't read any of my economics books, but do read this particular book, which is not in, on economics, but it's, it's a sort of mix of uh, biography and, and history. Uh, my father, the extraordinary life of an ordinary man. Uh, I, I, I think you'll really enjoy this book. Uh, 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 in a way, of all the books, I'm, uh, I feel the proudest of, of this one. Uh, all right, so uh, let me uh, uh, make a presentation. I think pres the purpose of the presentation I see mainly as giving us uh, some, uh, uh, you know, pegs on which we can hang the eventual discussion in the Q&A. Uh, I, I know that on everybody's mind is COVID uh, currently, but I'm actually in the formal presentation not going to say anything about it. Uh, uh, I, I think, you know, we need to step back a little. Uh, this is, uh, uh, after all, a university, and this is a lecture on, on economics, uh, and therefore we, we ought to think uh, more uh, in, in the longer term. Uh, and, and that is what I'm going to speak about. Uh, I think, you know, uh, usually when things go wrong, uh, 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 it is the government of the day that comes under fire, uh, which is just fine, because, you know, at the end, uh, it is the government of the day which has to take the necessary action. Um, but I think as serious uh, uh, scholars and academics, we ought to be aware that uh, for a lot of our problems uh, or any nation's problems, history matters a lot. What did the past policymakers do? Uh, 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 and, and, you know, a lot of the problems actually would not be present today uh, had uh, past policies really delivered uh, the outcomes that they desired to deliver. I, I, you know, the way to put it is that certainly we knew what outcomes we desired, which was the uh, 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 removal of poverty and bringing prosperity to everyone. I think, you know, if, if one wants to summarize the, the objectives, uh, then they have never changed. Uh, in effect, you know, uh, a removal of poverty and bringing prosperity has been the central objective throughout. Uh, 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 what has happened, of course, is that, uh, uh, that that prosperity really has not been delivered. Uh, uh, and, and for that, History matters, you know, and just think about it. For example, if you look at South Korea, China, Taiwan, India, they they started approximately in the same place in the in 1950. Uh, maybe small differences, but even some of the small differences were probably in India's favor. Uh, meaning, you know, India certainly was ahead of China even till that 1980 by easily 10 percent in per capita income terms. Um, but you know, countries that historically went on good policies, meaning in terms of uh, 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 policies that gave good, good growth outcomes, today don't have the problems that we have. Uh, 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 take South Korea, for instance, which clearly was seen as a basket case actually in the 1950s. The United States did not even think that its aid was worth anything uh, when given to South Korea because uh, they didn't expect uh, anything to happen there. And yet, through good policies, you know, South Korea started growing very rapidly it, uh, from about uh, early 1960s onwards. And today, of course, per capita income of $30,000, uh, it's, it's more like, you know, aspiring to be a developed country now. Uh, Singapore was very similar. Taiwan was very similar. China, a little later. Uh, uh, but, you know, by 1980, they real, or late, about 1979, Deng Xiaoping came and he realized that the policies that his predecessor, Mao Zedong, had pursued on the economic front were a failure and really quietly and quickly changed gears. And then China grew in the 80s, 90s and 2000s uh, at 10 percent, solid 10 percent growth. Uh, 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 you know, a lot of people say their data are not so good and uh, uh, inflated and so forth. But, you know, I don't think that is true because if you look at uh, one thing you cannot hide is the, your international trade flows. Uh, and in China's case, international trade flows tell a lot of its story. 
and and the general prosperity levels and so forth and how it has emerged as a global power today so it's clearly you know uh, in contrast i think you know our policy is uh, simply failed uh, and uh, we also failed to admit those failures for a very long time which means of course that uh, uh, we did not take the corrective action and even after we took the corrective action you know we it was a stop go process uh, we we did some very good things in the 1990s uh, in terms of policy shifts uh, uh, but then uh, uh, and early 2000s but then the whole period of 2004 to 14 uh policies again went back to the kinds of uh, uh, you know uh, particularly 2009 to 2014 we, we again went back to bad old ways uh, uh, uh that uh, did less damage perhaps than the early policies because a lot of the reforms that were required had been done by 2004 uh, first by prime minister narasimha rao's government and then by prime minister atul bihari vajpayee's government um we have come back to the reforms now but of course current scenario uh, has been then impacted uh, some of the very big reforms have happened under actually prime minister modi uh, initial i think initially first two years or so were slow uh, uh, distractions and all uh, then some big things were done uh, again in the second term started off with some very very big bank reforms things looked very good i was very upbeat but then not we are in the midst of covid uh all right so let me just you know what i want to do is give you show you a little bit uh, a, a, a few slides here uh and see if i can actually do that uh, uh, i hope i can uh and uh, um all right so open let's see what happened um somebody help Uh, hi sir uh so am, am i ready to open I, i i'm saying open tray but i'm not quite sure that it is letting ah now it is doing it okay very good now we got it okay so let's hope this technology works for me so this is one picture you see uh, which summarizes our history uh, <laughs> uh, from 1950 to 2019 20 uh, what this does is uh, it uh, shows uh, uh, in an index form uh, india's per capita income in real terms so you know anything that happens from inflation i have taken that out Uh, uh in fact we have a continuous series from 2000 uh, at 2004 five prices from 5051 to uh, 2010 11 uh, from 11 12 we shift to a new series so i had to do some correction there uh, so that's the only correction i have done the rest of the series really is as done by the mosp or the cso all right what does it show so what i have done is to index the income in 1950 at 100 so you can think of you know maybe 100 rupees per week or something like that if you want to think in terms of rupees but it's simply an index and what uh, the the curve shows is the change since 1950 so what you would see is i've given you some markers 64 65 the you know from 100 we go to 136 sort of decent for big for a beginning you know because uh, we inherited very bad past uh, first half of the uh, 20th century was a wash or be any increase in per capita income so this was some sort of you know uh, uh, improvement but then actually growth rate really remained very very slow very slow in the next 15 years we went from 136 to 156 base was now a little bigger than 100 Uh, so adding 36 here was worth uh, gets a little more a lot more credit than uh, the 20 here for these two reasons one it's only 20 that we added from uh, 64 65 to 80 81 uh, uh, but also that you know this was being added on the base of 136 to begin with um now uh, this period was really perhaps the darkest period of india's economic history a uh, lot of the bad policies uh, that eventually had to be uh, uh, replaced by better policies uh, were 
introduced during this 15 year period uh, and largely this was mrs indira gandhi's period uh, uh, to to many things not there's not enough time so i'm not giving you elaboration of these things right but you can come back if you if you have any doubts you can certainly challenge me in the q and a session uh, okay so now uh, this is where we come uh, so take the full 30 year period you know from 100 we go to 156 in 30 years this almost imperceptible change you know i mean if you take a snapshot fine you'll see that per capita income is one and a half times what it was in uh, the beginning period year but uh, those who, those of us who lived through this you know because 30 years is a long time and so you hardly saw any change to your life uh, that's almost literally true because you know i left india in 1974 and i can uh, uh, vouch for it that you know the, the previous decade that i noticed there was no change uh, uh uh now 80 to 90 we made some better progress and this is where some liberalization happened we also did pursue some very expansionary policies especially towards the last uh, uh, second half of the 1980s uh, uh, so liberalization plus expansionary fiscal policies did yield somewhat better results what we had accomplished in about you know uh, 30 years uh, uh, we were able to accomplish more than that in in just uh, uh, 10 years now of course the base is helping here as well because base is now grown to 156 so you know 1% growth on 156 is more like 1.56 whereas 1% growth on 100 would be only one so that is also helping the base is helping Uh, but clearly we also grew up more rapidly during this period and then of course the reforms get launched uh, and uh, we we see uh, 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 some solid progress happening there on so 1991 to 2001 in 10 years we have added about what 90 or so to this income again base helps but clearly we are going faster during this period and then 2000 2001 onwards is is the period where we really saw solid growth uh, what i know is uh, and i'll give you some growth growth figures in, in the next slide but but this was really the period during which we finally uh, uh, really uh, acquired momentum uh, and and within this 20 year period what we have got is uh, is of course uh, Uh, what it, it, it's so you are talking about 500 plus is what you have added compared to the entire 50 year period which was just uh, 300 plus now you see this is where as i said history matters uh, and and uh, uh, where we uh, missed was you know that that if 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 per capita incomes remain low even when you grow 10% it doesn't amount to much i mean it's like you know uh, your, your your own salaries when you start at very young a 15% raise doesn't mean much because you know your 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 base salary is so little uh, uh, or you can compare to the india and china right you know in india is is uh, about uh, let's say you know 3 trillion dollars uh, and china let's say about 12 trillion dollars uh, now you know if if india grows even uh, 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 if china grows that's just uh, uh, 2% right if china grows even 2% at 12 trillion uh, uh it adds more to the chinese economy in absolute terms than india would even with a growth rate of 8% uh and so the base becomes very very important not only base determines the standard of, of living of you and all of us as well as the future generations uh but it also determines you know how this uh, standard of living is going to rise with growth because uh, base is so critical so you can see here some growth rates i have given you uh, uh uh 51 to 65 we grew 4.3% in real gdp per capita was 2.3 that period which i call the dark period um, just 1% in per capita terms hardly anything nothing perceptible 81 to 88 then we 2.8% here 88 18 is a three year period actually this was driven very much by the expansionary fiscal policies and some liberalization of course that had happened very piecemeal very ad hoc in the early 80s and that got for those three years so i just like to distinguish between that because there has been some debate about these numbers in the 80s versus 1990s because uh, in my assessment 1990s was was a significantly better period than uh, in 1980s and that's at least one percentage point extra 
in terms of per capita incomes than what we got in, in, in the 81, 88 uh, period. So this three years really was, we did manage, but you know, it was done through expansionary fiscal policy, which led us to crisis. And that of course meant 91, 92 growth rate collapsed to minus 1% in per capita terms. Uh, this is the best period, 2003 to 20. Now you can break it up in uh, sub periods and all. But the basic point is that we are on a high growth trajectory now. And, and uh, few people realize that we have grown 7.4%. Now, you know, for a sustained 17 year period, that is the fastest that uh, for, for, you know, such a long period, 17 years has seen, I, 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 of course, we want it to be several decades more. But uh, it is clear, clearly the fastest uh, for that period, one, more than one and a half decades, that any democracy has grown in history. So we should not underplay our achievements either. Uh, 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 we, we have done well. And that is a momentum that needs to be both accelerated and, uh, 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 and maintained for, for, for a few decades, not, not just, you know, uh, uh, a few years. Uh, um, now, what is the challenge we face, right? So I want to identify the basic challenge, what, what according to me is India's fundamental challenge, right? India's fundamental ch challenge. Analytically speaking, India's really fundamental challenge is that India operates on far too small economic units. Let's see, I'm going to stop the, for now um, the, the sharing of the screen. Uh, I may want to show a couple more slides. We'll see. Um, now, uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental challenge we have, which, which uh, we often kind of, you know, glorify, in my opinion, uh, rather than actually try to address it, rather than recognize and address it, is that we operate on two tiny economic units. You know, our economic units across the board are tiny. You may get misled by thinking that, oh, wow, you know, we got the Reliance and we got the Tata and we got uh, uh, all these large tele telecom firms and so forth, uh, IT firms, uh, uh, chemical industry, mineral industry and all. <laughs> but you would see that, yes, those are large units, but that's not where your people are. Your workforce is not in those meaning the bulk of your workforce is not in those uh, units. In fact, uh, if you break it up, break it down, as I would uh, now, uh, there is plenty of evidence that actually we are operating on economic units that are too tiny. Begin with villages, right? Today, uh, <laughs> the bulk of the population is in villages, uh, only 30, you know, 2011 is our last census, so census is the most reliable one to, uh, for, for these purposes. Uh, uh, and uh, 2011, we were about 31%, less than 31% in urban areas. Uh, so almost 70% of the population was in rural areas. Villages, 600, uh, you know, 1951, we had 558,000 villages. And 2011, we had 593,000 villages. So 558 through some increase in the number of villages. There's been no consolidation. Uh, True that each village is a little larger now because population has grown, uh, but uh, the, the basic fact is that the bulk of the population is divided into this extremely large number of units. Uh, and that, of course, you know, and, and then lot, this is not homogeneous. There are a lot of bigger villages, but then there are lots and lots of smaller villages. I come from Rajasthan, where there are these very small hamlets spread all over the country, I mean, all over the state. Uh, uh, and, and you can imagine that that makes bringing infrastructure, electricity, water, uh, any of the services, <laughs> even when you talk of cash transfers, you know, banking, because it requires banking too, it makes for a very, very difficult task. So, you know, development always proceeds by people moving to better paid jobs. What we have tried to do is bring in every, you know, offer to bring in everything to the to the village level, telling people you stay there, we will bring these to you. But 70 years have passed after all, generations have gone uh, without these amenities. And even now for many of these hamlets, uh, these are bare minimum amenities. 
what we really need is for the population to move out seek better job opportunities uh, and and begin to and urbanize a lot faster I mean, we at least by official figures are the slowest urbanizing nation uh, uh, at least among the leading nations the 1951 census we were 17% urban 2011 60 years later we are still only 31% urban about 2 percentage points per decade some countries you know have done 2 percentage points per year uh, uh, in terms of urban expansion so that's my first kind of uh, uh, unit on you know uh, this population living in very small units then come to land holdings uh, that story again so again one stark dramatic figure 48% of india's land holdings about 70 million of those 48% of india's land holdings are less than half hectare less than half hectare and the average size of these holdings is less than a quarter hectare right what can you grow on such a small uh, tiny farm you know maybe we'll call it probably a kitchen garden or something it's so small uh it's a little exaggeration to call it kitchen garden but you know roughly that's what 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 it becomes uh, no family can actually make a, a, a proper living on such a such a small uh such a small land holding you have to be doing some other things as well um now come to to the firm size right come to the firm size so so let me now give you some more numbers uh, uh and and maybe i will venture to to get you to okay very good this technology is working and let me just show you just a few more slides here okay all right uh, okay first of all what is the composition of workforce in india so agriculture this is it 2018 19 uh, 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 P, uh, what is it called the 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 uh, periodic labor force survey uh, plfs latest one we have for the full year agriculture 42.5% of our workforce in, is in agriculture so employed mostly on those tiny little farms that i mentioned to you half of it on those tiny and you know uh, about two thirds of it is on on uh, farms that are less than a hectare or something of that sort you know so you can look it up but but that one figure is is uh, is pretty good illustration uh, it illustrates the the point now enterprises with fewer than 20 workers they employ another 44.5% of india's workforce right these are not big enterprises these are not the reliance and tatas and the uh, uh, various it companies uh, or telecom companies uh, these are very very small units uh, 44.5% of your workforce is in these units only 10% 9.9 but let's say 10% of the workforce is in these units with 20 or more workers now 20 is not large by the way Uh, i mean one should actually break it down further unfortunately the plfs survey uh, just makes uh, only this much distinction between 20 uh, 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 less than 20 versus 20 and more uh, but that's it you know so you got such a small workforce that is in these and this is where now the jobs the reason i am saying this matters so much is that the jobs in these tiny enterprises are not paying very well the value added is ti- in these tiny enterprises is relatively low and see here i mean this is from a survey we did in 2015 16 we meaning india did uh, i'm just taking the uh, end results from that survey this is the uh, mospi survey uh, uh, of unincorporated enterprises now remember that when i'm talking about uh, showing you the these uh, uh, large workforce here in, in in these enterprises of less than 20 workers most of it this really so by the way so if you add all that up that's like 80 uh uh 6 point or 87 percent together of the workforce just uh, uh, either in tiny farms or tiny enterprises right and and and, and, and so you're left with about another uh, 13 percent of which we don't know the three but there's just that 10 percent we know is 20 or more but why it matters because look at these numbers now 15 16 this is uh, in current rupees uh, what i've given you is 
they share in employment. So there are two types. These unincorporated enterprises are the ones where most of those workers are that I mentioned to you, the, the, the 44.5 percent here. And uh, 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 so these are the these workers are largely in these kinds of enterprises, of which about 62 percent are, are in what, what is called the own account enterprises, where there are no regular workers. Own account enterprises employ no regular workers. So these are kind of mom and pop operations, uh, basically home, you know, operating out of home or a shop or something like that. Uh, and the 38 percent are in establishment enterprises, which are defined as enterprises which employ at least one regular worker on a full-time basis. Now look at the value added per worker here. Just this is annual annual value added per worker in 2015-16 rupees, 73,000 to 74,000 rupees approximately. Now imagine this is per year. Even in established enter enter establishment enterprises, it's not very large. You know, if you work it out, maybe it will be what, uh, some 12,000, some, somewhere between 12 to 13,000 rupees per yeah, not not very large. So we are still, you know, this history I showed you of low productivity, you know, where the per capita incomes remained low and rose so little, etc. Et so the history is continuing with us. And and the only way to break this history is to create better paying jobs. And and that's what we are not able to do. Now compare this. This is third set of numbers. Which, which gives you, and you can look at basically the the uh, bottom table. I already showed you that, look, these numbers they, it, are, are not very large numbers, uh, value added per worker. Now, value added per worker in agriculture, so value added per worker in industry is 5.3%. Look at this number. In industry and services, value added per worker is about 4.5 times of what it is in agriculture. So, you know, if I can round it off to 5 or 4, whatever you want, Agriculture has a productivity value added is of, of less than one fourth of what it is, or less than one fifth of what it is in industry and services. But industry and services itself is not very high productivity activity overall. I mean, I this un, I mean these numbers understate a little bit uh, because uh, I don't have the big enterprises here, and big enterprises have to be represented here as well. But but basically, this tells you this is where we are, and and that is. The, the, the crux of the matter. Now, why does it matter? You might ask, why does it matter? You know, why can't we, you know, I mean, after all, we all talk about MSMEs, MSMEs. Uh, what is wrong with it? You know, small enterprises are great. This is what we think. But look, here is a comparison. This is a little bit, you know, because getting consistent data is a difficult thing, especially internationally comparable. So these are coming from 2005. But the point is made, you know. So, so 2005, this is the distribution of manufacturing workforce in India on the left side, and, and, and this set of graphs, and in China. What is the distribution in India? 84% are in small, which is less than 50 workers here for this purpose. Small is defined as enterprises with less than 50 workers. Only 10.5% in enterprises that are large. 200 or more workers and then medium enterprises which is between those 50 and 199 5.5 percent china opposite almost completely opposite uh, more than half is in large enterprises this is already in 2005 15 years ago uh, uh, very large enterprises then you got 23 percent another 23 so three quarters of the workforce is sitting here in in these larger or medium enterprises only a quarter is is, is in this now what does it translate into that's my next slide. What it translates into is, look at the labor productivity, average output per worker. This is average labor productivity. Suppose I make it 100 for both, 100 for large enterprises in India as well as in China. Of course, in China, it's much more than 100, I mean, compared to India. But let's compare China with China and India with India. So suppose large enterprises in India have an uh, average labor productivity of 100. What do the small ones have? They have almost one fifth of that. Small ones are giving only one fifth of that productivity. China, large enterprises, hundred, say, small ones are giving about almost sixty percent of what you get in large enterprises, and and medium also is higher. You see, what this is telling you is that look in India, these enterprises, small ones, produce only one fifth of what the large enterprises produce. But this is where my all of my you know bulk of my workforce is sitting. China, 
quite the opposite it has 60% of the productivity in in these enterprises uh and yet only quarter of the enterprises but even those guys are doing a lot better than my guys are doing relative to my large firms and this is where large size matters because in any sector the ecosystem is defined by large and medium enterprises it is you know uh, that is what defines the 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 the, the uh, uh, ecosystem uh, in the in the uh, particular sector if you got several large enterprises several medium enterprises then the whole labor market is determined by the uh, what those large enterprises are are doing for you uh, uh, and then because it then tightens the labor market for small enterprises and so small enterprises also have to shape up they have to work much harder on their toes and so forth uh, 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 because for workers they have to compete with these large and medium enterprises but in india if bulk of you know 90% of the workforce or 80% of the workforce uh, in agriculture industry is in these very small enterprises and they define the ecosystem and so there is you know lethargy in, in a sense of you know meaning not working hard enough uh, not having enough opportunity also not having enough capital that also matters because you know at lower level of per capita income your capital is smaller also so i think at the end of the day one needs to change the economic environment to allow you know we need to give up our this obsession with msmes and often when we say msmes we forget the second m which is medium medium is what you need to aspire to micro and small though that's where the votes are because that's where bulk of the workforce is the fact of the matter is that the average productivity in those is pretty low and uh, 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 no matter what we want to say the fact remains that is the fact that remains very so people are really paddling in the same place generation after generation i can give you many examples from my personal life uh that you know families are doing the same thing over the uh, over generations that's not how development happens and and somehow this uh, also you know our uh, often at the political level our uh, emotional thing about the rural areas and all uh, surely rural areas need to be nurtured but in the end you will i mean at the end of the day you will make life a lot better for all the people only by releasing these workers to go to the city uh, or you know if the industry comes there that's great also because urbanization can happen that way we know china's shenzhen for example you know which started with just 300000 workers at one point in 1980 and today it has about something like 12 13 million workers and per capita income is about 25000 dollars uh, so so you know if if industry grows up uh, 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 there then then it uh, uh, what is rural uh, yesterday becomes urban today but what we need is the emergence in many different sectors particularly labor intensive you know what we have also done Uh, because of the policy is clearly policy induced what has happened is that we have really uh, uh, um, uh, 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 ended up with much of our capital ending up in these very highly capital intensive sectors you know the, uh, the, the kinds of you know engineering industries chemical industries uh, uh, we look at you know petroleum refining takes up huge amount of capital uh, but the 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 so so the capital is sitting all in 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 these highly capital intensive industries which don't employ much workers labor intensive industries which employ a lot of workers don't have much capital uh, and so they of course that is a major reason why productivity remains low there also so this capital allocation has to shift out of the, 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 the to much more greatly towards labor intensive industries uh, apparel footwear furniture lot of light manufacturers etc Uh, but we also uh, uh, need large scale firms in these sectors you know you can come i mean i've given you some comparison with china already but you can compare with any other country you know our firms are tiny without larger and medium firms being there smaller firms will not flourish or smaller firms to flourish in productivity terms in good wages terms you need uh, the emergence of large and medium firms in all these particularly the labor intensive sectors which create employment opportunities if these opportunities come people's way rural population will move migration does happen we have seen you know massive movements of people uh, uh, during covid so we know that there is a large migrant force uh, uh, and, and and you know uh, the economic incentive is damn powerful 
uh, 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 my own father right ultimately uh, 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 having lost his mother his father at 5 and mother at 14 nevertheless managed to ultimately migrate uh, from from uh, uh, my village of suwana to jaipur uh, and in the next generation i could migrate uh, from uh, jaipur to the united states so the progress happens i mean it was a lot of pain for him to undertake what what he undertook uh, but uh, it made his own future life his own five future life my mother's future life and our children's lives much better uh, and 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 that is what we have to keep in mind you know so we we tend to think that oh, migration is a bad thing because you know people are migrating under stress but young move uh, young have ambition they want to move they are willing to sort of take some uncertainty of life uh and particularly when you're bachelor you're able to do it uh, as you grow older your responsibilities rise you become less enterprising but uh, 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 you know uh, uh, people want better lives and so we need to do things policies which facilitate that rather than uh, uh, put hindrances in them I, I, we have tended to kind of tie down the people to the rural areas to the villages uh, that we will bring all the benefits to you here Uh, but that's not how uh, life ought to be life ought to be that i make my own life i kind of you know uh, 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 generate my own, own own income rather than receiving it from uh, as as a transfer from uh, somebody else who is generating that income i want to be my own wealth creator i think you know most human beings want to do that uh, uh, and 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 that is ought to be the you know the the the, the, the really uh, our philosophical guiding philosophy so i'll stop there sorry i took a little longer but uh, 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 i hope uh, it completes the discussion thank you thank you so much sir uh, it was fascinating um i think the um, the gist is that you know small is not so beautiful anymore i think uh, that is the gist that um, uh, we are getting from you um, now can i request uh, dr sanjeev sanyal to give his chair person remarks um thank you very much um, professor panagaria professor bhanumurthy and the students and faculty of base university it's a pleasure to uh, chair this session of course um uh, and uh, after a wonderful speech by a friend and mentor professor panagaria it's a real pleasure to um sort of take this grand uh, sort of view of Uh, economic policy and economic history uh, because i think very often during these the times that we happen to be in right now we tend to end up getting taken up by the um, you know pressures of the time so it's a good to be reminded of the larger picture in some ways uh, at these times so um, you know one of the things obviously that professor panagaria just did is take a very long range of history of post independence history and this is important to get a sense of why what where in this uh, sort of long uh, while it may seem that uh, you know big having a size and a per capita income like that of china or in fact even of many of the other um, sort of high growth uh, asian countries is almost feels like they are so far out um, and so almost unachievable should remember that this was all achieved through this compounding and a decade or two of compounding can work miracles uh so i think that is something that should be remembered and we have in recent times notwithstanding the current uh, flux because of covid uh, despite this disruption the kinds of growth we have achieved in the last two decades uh, and through different economic uh, uh, sort of uh, regime uh, and political regime so it's uh, you know the fact that we are very often in india the the uh, political debate tends to be so acrimonious we lose track of the fact that we have actually maintained a reasonable uh, continuity in terms of economic policy over long periods of time so our system does work it can generate uh, uh, growth over long periods of time so i think that is something to be remembered now comes to an issue that he did um, bring up uh, in the second half of his uh, presentation which is this obsession with smallness and uh, by the way i have strong views on this as well and uh, very similar to those of professor panagaria and uh, somehow we have ended up defying uh, the smallness even defying jugad which is at the end 
uh, while it may may look cool for the odd innovation very often jugar is actually just a slip shot uh, making do that we do because we can't get the bigger thing right so i think the smallness of uh, indian economic units the inefficiencies of that smallness uh, whether it's land holdings or small companies and uh, villages uh, and so on i think it's important to recognize that much of what happened in recent uh, you know last 200 years since the industrial revolution was actually all about agglomeration and in here i have to say the economic profession has some uh, some uh, uh, sort of uh, ne- needs to take some cognizance of the fact that our students are very often first taught about the diminishing returns um, and less about increasing returns <laughs> So I, I'm sorry that uh, many of the textbooks really need to teach people about increasing returns to scale. Instead, we start the first chart. We are taught about marginal, diminishing returns. I think we already have set our minds in the wrong direction. <laughs> so uh, I think that is important to remember. And I think this issue of scale is important. Nevertheless, I will be because even though I agree with this, I will be provocative uh, and uh, lay out my first question. that while this may have been true for the last 200 years let's say is it the case that um communications technology particularly the one we are using just right now is it possible that we may well have encountered something that actually allows large small units to function together simply because of a dramatic increases in communications technology after all, many of us are now sitting around um at home and we have all become conversant at, at using this thing the next generation has gone through two years of uh, well one and a half years of studying online um so uh, is it possible that a future generation may actually be able to function in um in sort of more decentralized way than we tend to think of it i mean the next generation simply may think why on earth should i go to office we can all be sort of small units doing our own thing and there are economic models like gig economy etc that sort of fits into this highly decentralized way so i mean being a devil's advocate is it possible that maybe uh, we all go and live in you know small towns up in the mountains or in a less uh, uh, you know expensive real estate in a small town and i can continue to participate as the global the value chains at least in service many kinds of services i can do it and maybe except for things that require very large factories uh, we could uh, maybe survive with this kind of uh, more decentralized thing than we could have historically done in the past so with that let me stop and uh, pass it back to professor panagari and 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 hey th- thank thank you sanjeev uh, professor vanu marti shall i address the yes, question yes, go, go ahead go ahead yeah. so go ahead okay um so very good provocative question uh, let me just say a couple of things in response uh, first of all where is the big gig economy that's in the united states maybe a little in china but the united states well what are the companies apple microsoft google facebook these are all very large companies uh, i agree with you that you know we, we can all you know once the gig economy fully kind of materializes we can be sitting at a very distant places but the agglomeration not will is not what is going away what is happening is that you are able to agglomerate from different geographical locations it's a little different but agglomeration will still be required in those kinds of you know because in the end this gig economy is all about network economies of scale and so so we are going to going to uh, 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 still require uh, at least uh, uh, the, the the so called firm size will still have to be large only that they don't have to be geographically in the same place you can be we can all be sitting in our nice places and so forth i mean you know my own existence really the fact that i'm sitting in new york makes no difference whatsoever as far as my knowledge and understanding and reading of india is concerned i read the same uh, same newspapers and books etc that you all do uh, sitting in india and uh, i i read the same surveys as as, as you do and all and and uh, uh, um, you know periodic will, uh, visits allow me to to see what is happening on the ground as well so uh, uh, so 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 that is that part is correct now one last point on this which is of extreme importance is that maybe you know somewhere 30 years 40 years later the world 
at least the Indian world will, will look like what you are describing. But, you know, in the next 20 years, let's say, if I want to make India prosperous, uh, that conception is, 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 is a little misleading because I cannot, you know, the large, vast number of people who are employed in agriculture, uh, vast number of works who are employed even in just tiny little enterprises and so forth, they are not going to become part of the gig economy. Uh, that is a very elite workforce, uh, which, which would remain part of the elite economy. For the bulk of the economy, you need labor-intensive manufacturing. I mean, if there is a sort of bridge to, uh, at least, you know, we don't have any evidence of any country having done it an, a different way. Uh, every country, including the United States, Germany, UK, you know, in, in their past history, uh, if we track it down, labor-intensive manufacturing has been at the center. That is the bridge that then eventually brings you to, to all the other uh, good things in life. So with that, uh, may I request uh, Professor Banumurthy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, probably I will uh, say, I have compiled a few questions. In fact, uh, when we put up the registration form, there were, uh, I mean, I can find a few 80 questions and a few in the yeah. chat box. So I'm going to compile a few of these questions. Uh, there are a lot of questions related to the COVID uh, economy, but I will come to that later. Maybe one of the questions that is very close to what you uh, what you were discussing. You were talking about the capital not moving into labor-intensive uh, units, right? So one of the questions raised was: so we missed the the manufacturing sector boom, which uh, you know happened in most of the economy. Uh, you were in uh, Niti Ayo. Uh, you are the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog, and there, there was a renewed attempt uh, by the government to revise, the, uh, bring in uh, changes to the uh, manufacturing sector in India. So the question is, are we really trying to catch up, uh, or uh, how effective is going to be the catch up that we are trying to do? Yeah, so look, you know, uh, uh, we have done a lot of good things which should help, uh, because behind where we stand today, are the policies of that particular period that I mentioned, 65 to 81, particularly, uh, although one can go even farther back to Nehru era, but all these labor-intensive uh, products, until about 2005, were sitting on a list that, that is called, you know, all of you are very young, so uh, obviously you would not know unless you really read back the history, uh, uh, on a list called the Small-Scale Industries Reservation List. So whether it's apparel, footwear, even you're making a char, etc., whatever the small, you know, you, they make the soaps, what a large number of these, you know, light manufacturers, all of these were sitting on this list of small-scale industries reservation. What that meant was that only enterprises which were uh, defined as small could produce those items. Larger ones could not, were not allowed to produce those items. It was banned. So, you know, and the small here, SSI purposes, uh, for the most part, it was like investment of 2 million rupees uh, was was uh, uh, was the ceiling on the small enterprises what can you invest you know so so that part of history then the labor laws labor laws uh, uh, also stifled uh, after you know after small scale industries reservation was removed by 2005 it went away uh, but there's still labor laws and labor laws still till today after the reforms that the modi government has done we still have the problem that, you know, enterprises which have 300 or more workers have no rights to uh, terminate any workers. So that, of course, creates a huge amount of indiscipline in the workforce. So certainly it's potential scope for indiscipline in the workforce. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the enterprises have to be able to, you know, occasionally terminate workers who are uh, uh, disturbing the discipline of the workforce. Uh, you know, worker rights have to be protected, but there is a reasonable uh, uh, protection. Uh, but the unreasonable protection that we provide that you cannot uh, uh, terminate the worker under any circumstances if you have 300 or more workers, then, you know, I don't want to become large. Uh, 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 and and re remember that these... Labor-intensive enterprises operate on very thin margins. Margins are very small. So any disturbance of economic activity gets uh, pushes them into, into red. And, and the export markets for these products are super competitive. You know, you, you, you have uh, Vietnam's and you have Bangladesh and Cambodia's and China's and uh, 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 even in some cases Korea's, etc. competing in that marketplace. So, so you need to have, uh, be able to do that. Also, uh, I think uh, decades of this uh, uh, direction by the government, it's not direction, it was mandated 
that the successful enterprises only invest in these capital intensive sectors right because once ssi reservation happens uh, and 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 there were on top of that there was these you know monopolies and restrictive trade practices act of 1969 which actually forced all enterprises with 200 million rupees worth of capital assets which is hardly anything you know 200 million rupees is hardly anything even in those days uh, they were confined to a small group of very highly capital intensive industries so all our entrepreneurs all our business houses uh, completely got hardwired to operate only in capital intensive sectors so today you got to talk to people at cii at fikki nobody talks at all about making you know shoes or uh, stitching clothes or uh, you know this is beneath the I mean in a way you, you you created this brahminical kind of attitude among the enterprises also uh, and and this is forced in a way you know of uh, uh, five to six decades of this confinement of the ent- entrepreneurs into highly capital intensive uh, uh, industries so they also don't want to invest in, uh, uh, in into these activities it's the newer entrepreneurs who have to come in and out but uh, at least policy has to be liberalized particularly the labor laws now the modi government has given the power to the states so i'm hoping that some states will come forward you know uh, uh, and and relax that limit you know take that to uh, that 300 limit to 15000 uh, what is there you know I mean large firms have to emerge and particularly in these labor intensive sectors that's where you need the emergence and, and so we still need to do that so it's still work in progress we need to change attitudes also the entrepreneurs uh, 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 that you know these are also activities that uh, and also by the way policy still in some ways you know like when we do uh, uh, pli uh, it is done based on the amount of investment you know large investments uh, is, is what gets uh, 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 the subsidy under this pli scheme well <laughs> the more you invest the more the subsidy <clears throat> but then small enterprises like you know apparel clothing etc they are not such large enterprises they can't absorb uh, they can absorb workers they don't absorb as much capital so the even capital subsidy and sub actual help uh, helping pushing in these <coughs> uh, capital intensive sectors uh, uh, you know which don't create enough jobs okay okay uh, thank you uh, thank you sir for that response so the next question and uh, given that we have uh, we are running short of time uh, i will take up the question from the uh, covid uh, which is the most popular question the first question i think it's coming from one of our students it's do you consider the vaccines as a public good uh oh, it absolutely is it is it, it's not only a public good vaccine is a global public good if we had a global government then it, that, that global government should actually provide to the entire world <clears throat> and that would also be the most efficient solution uh, but certainly at, at the national level uh, it 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 is a, a, a public good uh, and and it should be provided basically uh, uh, through tax payer money you know i mean we spend tax payer money on all kinds of different things uh, 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 where where we should not i mean you know we we are running all these public sector enterprises you know uh, 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 that's a completely private sector activity and and there is no public good nature to 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 most of those public sector enterprises maybe you know railways might be different but for most part uh, it, 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 there is an uh, but the vaccine is 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 absolutely a public health issue and a national public health issue so i'm on you know i've written on this so i'll go to the next question do we uh, need another big stimulus announcement so we had one big stimulus announcement earlier when with the first covid wave but now it looks like we are you know going again on the back foot because of the second wave now how do we overcome this uh, the second wave and probably you know we are staring at a possible possible third wave as well so uh, how far the government can go about doing this you also talked about and combining some of the questions you also talked about investing in large scale industries right you need capital what is the possibility of uh, you know uh, you know the government maybe printing the money and uh, you know funding uh, a big ticket business investment okay so one question is about stimulus and related you are saying printing money uh okay first the, you know the stimulus because you know america is doing big stimulus and lot of the european rich countries did big stimulus uh, uh, this question comes up all the time i have said firstly maintained actually that what the government did was exactly the right thing to do uh, um, my reasoning is this that covid is is a very unique kind of shock 
uh, uh, to the economy. Uh, usually, when a shock happens, it either is a shock on the supply side or it is a shock on the demand side. So this is a shock which impacts both demand and supply. And uh, 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 stimulus works only on demand; it doesn't work on supply. So how do I solve? You know, so uh, if people cannot go in to their workplaces, even if you increase demand for televisions and whatever, whatever else, you know, it's not going to uh, make a difference to the supply because people can't go to work. Uh, the shoppers, in in fact, it's even worse. You can give cash transfer to the people. But uh, 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 if, if COVID means that you stay indoors or the stores are not even going to open, how are you going to translate that income into uh, uh, into uh, uh, effective demand? You cannot. Uh, in fact, data show very conclusively that actually all the stimulus that was given in the Western economies, economists did a study of 21 rich countries uh, and, and they gave these uh, uh, trillions of dollars worth of stimulus. And in the end, all it did was to double the savings. You know, the, the, the estimated the savings should have been without the stimulus uh, 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 transfers about three trillion. Savings ended up being six trillion in the first nine months of 2020. So that's from the Economist magazine. So, you know, this shock. If if we want to really get going with this, that what the, the specific things we need to solve is the COVID itself. Uh, uh, make conditions such that pe people as Consumers can go to the shops, shops can remain open, and workers, as workers, can go to their workplaces. I think that's what you need, and for, for that, you need to deal with the COVID. And so vaccine ultimately is what it is, since, you know, I mean, I've been arguing for quite a while now, more than six months, that we need to invest uh, big time uh, 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 in, in vaccines. Uh, now, you know, Whenever the subject comes up from the policymakers, bureaucrats, one hears about, oh, we are about to do this. But what about now? I think even today, our vaccination rate has dropped to less than 2 million. One and a half million roughly is where per day is where we are vaccinating. And I'm completely mystified because at least if I look at the publicly available data, they say that, you know, uh, uh, Serum Institute is producing at least 60 million units per month. Uh, and uh, Covaxin is doing another two million, uh, another 20 million uh, uh, per month. That me means about 80 million. That gives you about 2.78 million per day. Why is our vaccination rate is still at 1.5 million? I, I mean, that's that's a mystery. And some of the policymakers, the bureaucrats, are not giving an answer to that question. They keep saying that you know, next five months, last five months, August to uh, to to uh, December will do 2.2 billion or 2.1 billion vaccines uh, and that will you know vaccinate by the end of the year uh, everybody i just don't see how this can this can happen it's not possible unless the at least we have to do as many vaccines as, as vaccines available today and we have to get to something like 7 8 million vaccines per day that's that's that is minimally that's the rate we would require to actually vaccinate the entire, or at least, you know, let's say 65% of the population, uh, uh, which is the, you know, uh, 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 I'd say what, above 18 population uh, 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 by the end of the year. Okay, I will uh, quickly take one last question, uh, since uh, you have brought up the case of the MSMEs. So one of the questions was related to the Indian banking sector. Uh, which is already uh, facing the issue of the NPAs, non-performing assets. And uh, you are right now uh, saying that uh, we have been, you know, you know, giving too much of, uh, or rather the Indian economy has been focusing a lot on these uh, small firms where the productivity is much lower. So are we, are, are we falling into some kind of a trap? Uh, because there is a push from the, uh, the government as well as from the public uh, to invest more in, or rather the force the banks to, uh, give more loans to the small-scale industry. So are we falling into some kind of a trap there? No, let, don't get me wrong here. So NPA problem is, uh, you know, certainly MSMEs have also contributed to it, but the big problem is, is, is uh, a big part of the problem is coming from, from very large firms. So NPA issue is a little bit different one. Uh, and uh, even, you know, also, don't get me wrong on this, that, you know, that what the enterprises that I'm talking about, tiny enterprises, you know, less than 20 workers, that's what those, you know, unincorporated enterprises. Uh, I don't think they get, 
to my knowledge maybe you know sanjeev knows differently can uh, can can clarify but uh, to my understanding you know these tiny little firms you know less than 20 workers they don't get bank loans uh, it it is somewhat larger firms so so probably some of them i mean you know medium size or some of the small firms probably get it you know but on the higher end side uh, so so uh, you know uh, what i'm saying is, when i say our obsession with msmes uh, is micro and small and 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 what i'm saying is that in terms of the you know messaging etc we seem to encourage people you know they kids remain small that's a good thing i mean it, it's not simply of of, of the you know the, the bigger issue another way to put it would be that look you know the the micro need to become small small need to become medium medium need to become large and large need to become even larger i mean what you need is enterprise size has to grow what is happening you know manish sabarwal sometimes uses a good terminology he says that you know uh, we, we 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 produce uh, 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 what is the word dwarfs or something right dwarf firms or uh, or midgets you know that 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 don't grow what, what we so we grow enterprises that are small and remain small what is important is you know you can start small that's not the issue but you to be able you to grow large over time you know but if for generations you are doing the same activity then you know you are not becoming prosperous uh, so that's what i uh, that, that's what i mean by the environment ecosystem you know that that it has to bring pressure on enterprises to survive and to survive uh, they, they they have to uh, get get bigger and and the policy should therefore reward becoming bigger it should not be you know, a reward that you remain small so that's the message okay sir uh, thanks for taking up those questions uh, given the time constraint uh, i think we will wind up the session uh, so bharamurthy sir uh, do you have anything to ask or add there no 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 you can go ahead you can yeah. okay so uh, this is the second uh, bees university distinguished lecture and we are uh, privileged to have uh, professor uh, arvind panagiriya as the, the distinguished speaker uh, it was a very insightful uh, speech uh, starting with the indian economic uh, history and i'm sure uh, our students who are studying indian economy and in general they have taken down a few uh, few points from your speech and and especially i was uh, very much fascinated by the uh by your uh, take on the uh, tiny economic units and the implications and i'm sure you know everyone uh, sitting here are also uh, you know thinking about the same thing and how actually that uh, brought down the productivity right and uh, of course it was a uh, you know i hope not for me like our productivity from the small scale firms is just one fifth of the large scale firms and probably let's hope uh, you know the policy makers look into this and as you said uh, they will reward uh, or uh, you know, growing bigger uh, firms to grow bigger thank you sir thank you for that speech and uh, sanjeev sanyal sir uh, uh, you know i think you know our microeconomics lecturers has taken a note of that we would rather look at the uh, uh, increasing utility uh, than uh, <laughs> diminishing marginal utility but of course uh, as you said uh, it's a long term it's a long term long term thing uh, not just uh, you know some something that magic can that can happen in five years and the magic of compounding uh, uh, will definitely you know take us uh, forward thank you for that and uh, we expect you to uh, come to the campus as soon as it re- reopens uh, you are a member of our governing council uh, we hope to see you in the campus and uh, talk to our students directly and uh, with this i wind up this session thank you all for joining uh, we will have more events coming up uh, in the future uh, once our end semester exam gets over and uh, we hope the normal seat return soon we'll have more events coming up and uh, we'll keep you all posted so I, I i thank everybody i thank all the participants who have joined from uh, different parts of the country i could uh, see like uh, from different institutions uh, we are growing i mean uh, the reach of base university Uh, is increasing and we are really happy about that we are really happy that you have joined uh, we will have more events and will keep you posted join us so with this uh, i shall uh, end the session thank you all for joining thank you bye bye